Good afternoon or evening, wherever you may be, and welcome to the gathering's first event of the 2021-2022 program year, celebrating art and spirituality as Asian Pacific Americans with our talented panel, Naomi Hirahara, Dustin Sa, and Joshua Wong. My name is Sharon Crandall, and I'm part of the gathering team. Whether this is your first time joining us, or if you're already an old friend, welcome, and thank you for taking time today to join us. The gathering is a space for Asian Pacific Americans in the Episcopal Diocese of Los Angeles. But for me, it just feels like home. It feels like family. So I invite you to join us and come back as much as you can. In the Episcopal Diocese of Los Angeles, we are grateful to have bishops who are champions for multicultural ministries. Today, we have Bishop John Taylor joining us, and we also have uh, Bishop Diane Bruce. Bishop Diane is an unwavering advocate, defender and promoter, and a beloved treasured friend of the gathering. She holds a special place in our hearts, and we are so grateful to have her with us today, all the way from her sabbatical. So I welcome Bishop Diane Bruce. Thank you, Sharon. Uh, I bring you all greetings from a cottage in the Mont Eagle Sunday School Assembly right outside of Sewanee here in Tennessee. Um, the squirrels are dive bombing the porch roof, which is made of tin, hoping to knock down as many acorns as they can. Earlier this afternoon, they had quite the dance party up there, those squirrels. So I'll try to make this short uh, so you don't have to hear, you know, all of the, the activity out on the porch. Um, I am grateful to be with you all this evening uh, and uh, extremely grateful for the gathering team for putting this event together, for bringing together Naomi and Dustin and Joshua to be on a panel to talk about art, something that is near and dear to all of their hearts in a different way. So I'm glad you're here to experience that with them. So with no further ado, uh, another Dustin, not one of our, our panel, is going to open us with prayer. So thank you all for being here and do come back. You, you will just enjoy all of the offerings that the gathering has put together. Thank you. My opening prayer will be bilingual, first in English, then in Spanish. The Lord be with you. Oremos. Almighty God, who blesses creation with the power of art, exalt the voices of artists from historically marginalized communities. Cast down the barriers that keep us excluded. Multiply the solidarity to our cause, that our stories dignified may transfigure our conversations, and we may find belonging in beloved community. Amen. Dios omnipotente, nos bendigas todos con el poder del arte. Enaltezcas las voces de todas las artistas marginadas. Derribes las barreras que nos excluyen. Multipliques los que apoyan nuestra causa. Que nuestras historias dignificadas transfiguren nuestras conversaciones y encontremos la pertenencia dentro de querida comunidad. Amén. Hello, everyone. It's so nice to be with you all again. Uh, I'm Peter, Peter Huang, and I'm one of the leaders of the gathering and also a priest in the Episcopal Diocese of Los Angeles. Um, today, we will hear from three amazing panelists. This past week, many cultures got to celebrate the abundance and harvest with the Mid-Autumn Moon Festival, as well as the Chisuk, the Korean Thanksgiving. Today, we get to explore the richness of gifts through the lives and the stories of our panelists and hear about art and spirituality from the perspectives of Asian Pacific Americans. There's a diversity in medium uh, here with us um, through writing, through music, through visual arts. And we'll together explore what does it mean to create as Asian Pacific Americans. 
We will first have a conversation with our panelists. Then around 5 p.m. Uh, Pacific time, we'll open up our time to um, for questions from you. So during the panel conversation, uh, feel free to write in your questions in the chat and we'll collect them and use that during the Q&A time um, around five o'clock today. So without further ado, let me uh, introduce to you our panelists. Naomi Hirahara is an Edgar Award-winning author and journalist. Through her writings, she's explored the impact of World War II, in particular, um, the effects of Hiroshima and the incarceration of Japanese Americans uh, in the US. As a journalist, Naomi was the editor of Rafu Shimpo, the Los Angeles-based newspaper for the Japanese American community. You can find out more about Naomi and her literary works um, at her website, naomihirahara.com. And uh, Naomi, thank you for being with us today. Thank you for having me, Peter. And also a special shout out to Jenny Goto, who's been a long-term friend. And actually when I was in New York for a, a book event, the story about this group kind of came up because there was an Episcopalian oh. from New York. So yeah, you oh. are well known. Well, good, <laughs> um, good, good. Um, I'm, I'm gonna first just uh, briefly introduce um, all three panelists. And okay. then what we'll do is we'll hear from each panelist about um, uh, specifically their work. So thank you, Naomi. Um, Dustin Sa is a classically trained cellist and cello teacher, uh, and his music has been featured in many of our gatherings. Originally from Southern California, Dustin studied at uh, Rochester, New York at the Eastman School of Music before returning to LA. He is the Associate Artistic Director of Street Symphony, an organization that works closely with the Skid Row community through music empowerment and relationship building. And more about Dustin and the Street Symphony can be found on streetsymphony.org. And uh, great to have you back with us, Dustin. Nice to see you all. I'm excited for this conversation. And Joshua Wong, most recently a Claremont School of Theology Master of Divinity student pursuing ordination in the Episcopal Church and one of the leaders of the gathering. But don't let these theological pursuits fool you. Joshua was once the lead footwear designer for Ralph Lauren's Purple Label and a jet setter among the fashion elite. He also um, has been an active mentor for students pursuing design. More information on Joshua's work can be found uh, on, uh, at joshuawongdesign.com. And we're so glad to have you on the panel today. It's my honor and pleasure. I look forward to talking to you guys later. Great. So uh, to get to know each panelist a little better, we've asked them to take a few minutes to tell us about themselves and their personal connection to this topic of art and spirituality as Asian Pacific Americans. And we've also asked them to share their work with us as a way for us to get to know them better. And so, Naomi, could you start us off? And I believe you will also read an excerpt from your latest book, Clark and Division. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, so tell us about you and your work. Um, I guess, yeah, uh, in the little flyer you had, you identified me as a journalist and uh, I guess an author, writer, novelist. Um, which is very true. I, I hold on to the identity of journalist and an author in both hands, as well as my Christian faith. Um, I am uh, grew up in an unchurched family. Um, so in, in some ways, that was, I think, an advantage because I felt like I to truly uh, wasn't encumbered by any cultural things. It was more, I was so attracted to the concepts of forgiveness and mercy in Christianity. And um, I grabbed hold of that in elementary school. Um, and this conversation, I look forward to, um, I, actually, I think the last time I had this kind of 
intersection of um, faith as well as maybe ethnicity was I taught a, a writing uh, class um, actually at Evergreen in the late 1990s. And that was after I had returned from um, a writing workshop for Christian excellence in Wichita, Kansas um, with the Milton Center, which had been started by uh, Richard Foster. So, um, but we can talk more about that later. And um, this is my latest, this is I think my 12th book, um, 12th novel. I've also done a number of nonfiction works and it's called Clark and Division. And it's referring to uh, a certain um, intersection in Chicago. So this is a story about two sisters. It's a story about the Ito family, a Japanese American family that goes from Los Angeles to Manzanar to Chicago. They're released early. The uh, older sister goes first and the younger sister, this book is told from her point of view, Aki and Aki and her parents follow um, some months later, only to discover something terrible has transpired. So it's up to Aki to find out the truth and also carry her parents during this uh, tumultuous period of time. So I'm going to just um, read you just the very beginning of the book, Clark and Division. Rose was always there, even while I was being born. It was a breech birth. The midwife, soaked in her own sweat, as well as some of my mothers, had been struggling for hours and didn't notice my three-year-old sister inching her way to the stained bed. According to the midwife, mom was screaming unrepeatable things in Japanese when Rose, the first one to see an actual body part of mine, yanked my slimy foot hard and good and hard. Ito-san! The midwife's voice cut through the chaos and my father came in to get Rose out of the room. Rose ran. Pop couldn't catch her at first, and when he finally did, he couldn't control her. In a matter of minutes, Rose, undeterred by the blood on my squirming body, returned to embrace me into her fan club. Until the end of her days and even beyond, my gaze would remain on her. So that's a little snippet. Thank you, Naomi. And, um... I'm, I'm really glad that there is this intersection to, um, I know you've been on your book tour and uh, as with, uh, with this, uh, with Clark and Division just recently published and to have a, um, this occasion to talk about your faith and uh, spirituality and um, your work and your identity. I'm really looking forward to this uh, conversation. Thank you. Dustin, um, please tell us more about yourself and your work and um, how this topic today intersects um, all that you do. Everyone, um, my name is Dustin and uh, you know, I just wanna piggyback off what Naomi was just talking about and her experience as uh, coming from a um, you know, um, unchurched background and family. Uh, I, I actually had quite the opposite experience. Um, a lot of my identity as a Korean American um, stemmed from my experiences going to a Korean American church and growing up having that space also be uh, the cultural and um, uh, community space for uh, my family to be connected to other Korean Americans here in Los Angeles. And um, that, that intersection actually, I feel, ha had um, some traumatic experience to uh, my relationship with God and my understanding of belongingness as an Asian American. Um, as, as Peter mentioned, uh, my primary work in Los Angeles is working with an organization called Street Symphony, and um, Street Symphony has been an incredibly uh, healing space for myself as um, a, I, I get to work with many folks who view community and view um, identity and view uh, music and the arts as not a commodity, but as a lifeline. And, um, and, and as, as I've been uh, rediscovering what my identity is, I, I've been grappling with the fact that my gifts that God has given me as an artist um, are not uh, things to be commodified, but actually that I am um, entitled to own a divine responsibility to convene belongingness and relationship. Um, another really weird intersection is as a classically trained cellist, I, I um, kind of unpacking my experiences growing up learning the cello, I, I, I realized that um, my pursuit in 
being an excellent cellist was also in some ways my my way of assimilating and uh, into Western culture and also um, stripping myself of some of my heritage as a Korean American. And yet at the same time, I'm here today as a classically trained cellist and as um, an individual who uh, turns to composers like Bach and Beethoven and, uh, you know, um, Brahms as my solace, as my place of uh, relational laboratory. Um, so all of these things are super complicated and I'm super excited to unpack a lot of this. I'm excited to uh, work through a lot of this with everyone here. And um, as my musical offering to this space, I actually wanted to share a piece by Bach. Um, it's the Gavotte from his fifth suite in C minor. And um, this piece has particular importance to me because um, I recently found a spiritual community here in Los Angeles through the community at Church of Our Savior in San Gabriel. And um, this was a piece that I was able to explore in that space. And um, you know, talking about uh, the arts within our, our community here, um, playing in a beautiful church like Church of Our Savior actually gives me a lot of inspiration. And I learned so much by playing in that space. So I wanted to share that raw and authentic gift to everyone here. Uh, just, just a short snippet of this piece. Thank you, Dustin. That was beautiful. Nice. Just so we re really appreciate how you just channel the, the spiritual aspects of that piece. And um, you always play with such passion and uh, engagement. Thank you very much. Yeah. Uh, and I look forward to, and when we do get to talk about your each of your Christian experiences, um, how the church has impacted uh, you, whether as unchurched or churched in each of your spiritual experiences. Thank you, Dustin. Um, Joshua, um, I know that many people already know you through your role in the gathering, but uh, people may not know as much about your background in art. So please tell us uh, more about your personal connection with this topic. And I know you brought some photos for some uh, show and tell too. So, um, yeah, thank you so much, Peter. Uh, there is a part of me that <clears throat> I don't really talk about very much. Uh, and it's not because I don't like to talk about it but it just brings up so much excitement in so many people's lives, especially if you're a woman, because um, my background is really, the most recent background is I'm a shoe designer. And before that, I was an advertising art director. So to give you a little bit of background, when I was four years old, my mother still tells me the story 
that she saw me drawing women's high heel shoes and, and racing cars. And I'll never forget it because I still to this day believe that they are two symbols of power and two symbols of freedom. So um, that was the beginning of what I was going to become later on. But still in kindergarten, my mother also just reminded me yesterday that there was a boy that took all my crayons from me and said they possess magic because he couldn't use his crayons to do the same things. And as a little boy, I had no idea what he meant, but I know that it was so easy for me to do art, illustration, design, and, and all that. Well, I was very, very fortunate that I had parents who really revered art. And unlike a lot of Asian families, who only want their children to become doctors and engineers and mathematicians and scientists. Both sides of my family were very creative. So I was very fortunate to get accepted from to Art Center College of Design as a high school student right after high school. So from there, I became an uh, advertising art director and I did that for 15 years. And then I moved to New York to pursue my dreams and to change my whole life. And that dream was to become a shoe designer. So later on, I'll tell you more about how I got into the business, but that has led me to more, almost 30 years of becoming a shoe designer. And today I'm still a freelance shoe designer, but I'm putting all my concentration in seminary at Claremont School of Theology and Beloy House, which I love very much. And I am on the pathway of, I am a postulant for, uh, for the pathway of ordination to be a, a priest. So I will, I am continuing to discern God's direction and God's guidance in this whole matter. Because my three areas of great interest is the Asian Pacific American community, the LGBTQ community, and also the fashion industry and art community. Because I think that those three areas are really in need of knowing that God loves them very much. So I'm very, very happy to be here today. And I am um, actually, if you're interested, you can actually go on my website to see really all the shoes. But I was able to collect some shoes that I designed. This is a pair from Ralph Lauren. And this is a metal heel. And this was during the collection of the um, Brancusi, who's the, who's the sculptor. And Brancusi does everything in metal, a lot of things in metal. So Mr. Lauren actually asked me to go to see his gullwing Mercedes-Benz and to look at the knobs. And he wanted the exact finish on the heels of, of this collection. So this was one shoe. Here's a pump. And these are for the Ralph Lauren Women's Collection. And then I also have some samples of Ann Klein and Company. Right over there, I went to Ann Klein. And this was a stiletto boot that I designed with the nipped uh, toe. And then the, this is also a pair. But these were all used in the national ads. Mr. Lauren would ask me which shoes were my favorite, and he ended up putting them in the ads. So um, this gives you a little bit of background of what I do, what I love, and where I'm going in my life. So back to you, Peter. Thank you, Joshua. Um, do you have those shoes in the on display somewhere, or did you have to... Did you take it out of your collection for today? No, the only shoes that I actually have, my sister-in-law bought. Oh. And so I signed the bottoms of all these shoes for her and she never wears, she never wears it. Okay. So uh, those are the only ones that I have. I'm actually gonna go to eBay to buy a lot of the old ones back. I think that's gonna be a good idea. Yeah, but this is just a very small sampling. Thank you, Joshua. And uh, thank you, Naomi and 
Dustin. Um, it's just wonderful to see such creativity in this space and and through your lives. And um, I um, want us to I want to start us off with a question reflecting on that. Um, just as we understand God as being a creative being, um, how have you seen yourself in the image of God as you create? And um, in particular to that, how have your uh, identities as Christian and Asian Pacific American been a part of your creative process? Who would like to take a take a stab at that? I'll try. <laughs> Um, you know, I was thinking, I, I, I don't view myself as, um, a stereotypical writer. Um, I think many people might have this image of the writer just being totally solitary, you know, and just working on her writing and then, you know, shooting it out to the world, but essentially, you know, being pretty much, um, in solitude, you know, but I've really come to see that for me, uh, writing is about relationships, uh, relationship, and it's about, um, I, one thing for me, I'm a Japanese American, I'm kind of unusual among my Japanese American peers, in that um, my mother is an immigrant, she's from Japan, and my father, uh, he was born here, um, born in Watsonville, California, but um, taken to Hiroshima when he was young. So um, both my parents were, they're atomic bomb survivors. So that part of their history is pretty seminal because I don't think I would have been born if it weren't for the atomic bomb, which seems really strange and, you know, but I, I guess that's the way God works <laughs> at times. So, um, Anyway, uh, I think I, I took one of those Clifton personality tests and, and they said my number one thing was context. And I thought that is like the most boring personal trait to have, <laughs> but I can really see how um, it, it kind of informs for me uh, writing. Um, I, for one thing, as a journalist, I'm very curious about other people's stories, how they came to be. And um, I think for myself, as uh, a daughter of these parents who had gone through this traumatic experience, certainly part of um, my storytelling motivation is to um, expose these kind of stories to light that haven't been told. So, um, and, and yeah, so I, I derive great joy actually when um, my writing inspires people to dig, to talk. You know, they may not like what I write, but it might in, um, stir them to have conversations with other people and um, become a little more aware of another person's story. Or else it could be because I'm so into context and history, because so much of Asian American. Um, our existence, you know, hasn't been told, or there's so many gaps, you know, I, I, I get great joy of people like um, thinking about what I've written, and how it may color in the gaps of their own lives. So it's kind of, I, I know it's not a straight creativity answer, but that's, uh, I think, why God has created me to write. And um, yeah, I, I'm not sure if I really answered your question, but those are the things that I've been thinking about. Thank you, Naomi. I, I think what, what you're saying just made me think about the, how important it is to feel seen and heard and how storytelling and, and storytelling isn't just words. It's also the picture that you create through your stories and, and um just for people to have their story being told and people feeling seen and heard is so crucial to one's sense of um, being and 
sense of um, significance too. I'd love to jump off a lot of things Naomi was talking about. Um, I, I feel I, I resonate so much with everything you're sharing regarding our work as artists being about sharing in community and uh, and and finding a place of belongingness. Um, I think interestingly. Um, part of my pursuit of becoming a classical cellist in, in, in some deep part of my mind growing up was to be a rank and file um, individual who can kind of uh, blend into the background. Um, my, both my parents were immigrants from Korea who immigrated in the 80s and um, kind of had that strong mentality of uh, how American can we be, how, how, how invisible can we become in the society so that we can succeed. Um, and, uh, and, you know, I think um, growing up and, and, and finding, you know, uh, um, a love for the cello, uh, like, I, first of all, like, I think really startled my parents, um, you know, I was supposed to be the IT person or, you know, do some kind of biology undergrad and, you know, um, and, um, but, 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 but that, that passion for cello really quickly developed into, oh, this is like a very American thing to do, you know, like, it, it, it's very, um, the pride in my playing uh, evolved more into how cultured I am, you know, how, how, how closely to the ivory tower can I come into proximity to. And um, I think where this intersects with my, uh, my, my relationship to God and my Christianity was uh, also to just be a rank and file individual, you know, as a Korean American Christian, um, there's nothing special about me. There's not, I'm, you know, I'm just part of a bigger thing. Um, and this almost feels like it falls in line with this whole idea of belonging as community. But I didn't find, I didn't know how I could contribute to, to my faith. I didn't know how to contribute to my identity as a Korean American or my, my you know, the people I share in um, spirituality with. Like I, I was a cellist as a profession and like what I did spiritually needed to be separated from that because there was no way to contribute. And um, and and that that actually did really uh, push me away from my faith. Uh, you know, after I graduated high school and went to go study um, in, uh, in Rochester, I, I found myself very isolated um, spiritually. I didn't feel like I had a community, and I felt very um, uh, relieved, so that I didn't have to have this juggle of you know pursuing something that other Korean Americans aren't pursuing, and you know trying to fit into a community. Uh, when uh, a, a, like a very, very special moment for me a couple of years ago, um, actually right before I intersected with the gathering was um, I had a colleague invite me to a service at, uh, at uh, St. Mark's Episcopal in uh, Glendale. And I remember going to the service and just being completely blown away by how beautiful the service was. I mean, this was just truly a work of art. The organ player was unbelievable and, you know, I, yeah, just the, the church is so gorgeous and, and, and to feel completely overwhelmed by this sense of beauty, uh, you know, when, when the procession was happening, the incense were the filling the air and they're just the holy voices, the choir. I, 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 I had this such visceral reaction in my body and I remember taking communion and, and you know, I, I come from a very a Protestant, like a uh, Calvinist kind of background um, growing up in the Korean church. And I remember going up to take communion and like, walking into the altar and having the voices on either side with the organ blasting. And I'm like kneeling for the, like, <laughs> for, for the bread. I'm just like, oh my God, like Jesus come please. You know, and, um, and, and it, it, made, it, it gave me this visceral reaction. Like, oh, you know, God is an artist. And um, I've, I've lived my entire life trying to blend in. You know, I thought that that was my role as a Christian was to not cause any trouble to, to, to find peace and, uh, you know, um, uh, 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 a contentment with with being invisible. You know, I I I I shouldn't have a political agenda. I shouldn't have like uh, aggressively spiritual agenda. I'm going to eventually win my like you know uh, rank and file tier uh, orchestral position and be happy being a member in that way, a soldier. And um, I, my experience with the Episcopal Church has actually been. An invitation to be who I am, and to um, and 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 feel like 
I can name and hold the gifts that God has given me to better the community I want to belong in. And um, yeah, I'm, I'm really excited to jump into that. I, 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 I go to church every week, so excited to be part of a ritual that is so beautiful and so artistic. And I, 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 I do deeply believe that God is an artist and um, he has given us very unique gifts that resemble his gifts. And um, yeah, I don't know. I'm, I'm, I, I was very, uh, I'm already feeling very emotional talking about this subject because it's been something that has really um, helped me find my relationship to God and a relationship to a community I feel um, belonging in this end. Thank you, Dustin. Um, I appreciate just your description of liturgy and how really art can be so multi-sensory. You know, we don't we don't just hear and and see, but we also can sense and smell the incense, and um, there's so much richness in, in that. Um, for those of you that that may not know, um, uh, Dustin also contributed a piece in March. Um, we had a um, gathering spot, which is our smaller community, um, right after the Atlanta uh, massacre or shootings of um, um, where um, it's the senseless uh, killings in Atlanta. And, um, you know, Dustin, you were talking earlier about the trying not to sort of reclaiming part of your own heritage and the piece that you played there. And I think we have it on our YouTube channel. So um, I encourage those of you who haven't heard it to check it out. Um, Dustin arranged a piece that that started with Arirang, which is a, this Korean song of resistance. And, uh, and many of the women killed were of Korean descent. And then just poignantly led into, were you there? Were you there when they crucified our Lord? Were you there? And this cello piece that he arranged is just what an integration of being Korean American, um, being, being Christian of faith, and um, just such a powerful piece. So I encourage um, those of you who haven't heard it yet to, to, check, to check it out. And um, we're so grateful, Dustin, for your musical um, contributions to, to our uh, events. It's true. Yeah. You know, I, I really agree with both of our panelists. Um, and I think that when I was thinking about this question, one of the things that was hard for me to answer is the fact that God is in all create creativity, in all creation. And it is really hard to kind of separate any of it, whether it is in the process of, of writing or in the process of being a part of the music. Um, and that leads me to my answer of uh, what is what do I see as the image of God? And I think for myself, I became a completely much more relaxed, creative person when I came out. And I think that for me, whatever is holding me back, all my life of holding me back um, was released when I, be, when I was honest with myself, when I was honest with God. And that really opened me up to where I journey through in life right now. Uh, whether it is still working with clients and just deciding how to help them create new product, or whether it is in seminary thinking about where does God lead me in the world, it is really about first becoming authentic and becoming real. And if I didn't do that, I don't think I would truly be a, a, as creative as I am or can be. Um, the first part, the second part of the question is, you know, how has, how has like your Christian identity or your Asian Pacific identity uh, been part of the creative process? You know, um, I think back at both of my careers in advertising and in fashion, and I call it Fifth Avenue in New York City, which is advertising agencies, and Seventh Avenue, which is the fashion industry. Both of them are extremely intense, extremely um, deadline driven, and extremely filled with, I would say, probably very 
you know, un, you know, unique people. And people ask me, well, do you watch R Project Runway? And I said, no, absolutely not. Because I'm so tired of being around people that are like that. And that is exactly the place God puts me at. That is exactly the place where I can be some kind of a light. When I left Ralph Lauren, nobody usually gives a party to someone because someone either walks out or someone's mad, but they actually threw me a party and they gave, someone gave me a big bottle of Verve with a big, big, beautiful ribbon. And the card said, you have been a light in our hallways. And I'm like, whoa, I didn't know that. But I know that God was a light in those hallways, in decisions when it was very tense, runway shows where you'd have a, a week of preparation and it would last 20 minutes and it's done. Where people are crying in the background, throwing shoes from one model to another because there's not enough of that style to go around. Or it's, um, you know, I remember parading around as a group of Ralph Lauren people going to the flea market in Paris. And one, the head designer held my arm and she had this long train behind her, sweeping the floor behind her, like in her dramatic way as we went shopping. And she was singing Amazing Grace with me because she was a Southern girl who grew up as a, as a Christian. But Christianity, the whole idea of Christianity is not in the vocabulary of these people. And I want them to be because God is in the process. God loves them. God loves them for their creative ideas. Even if growing up as an, as an evangelical, you know, we were taught that materialism was bad. You know, buying expensive things were bad. Driving expensive cars were bad. You know, you need to sacrifice. You need to blah, blah, blah. But they really missed the point that people who created all of these things are gifted, they're gifted from God. So I think that that was my experience of how, how creativity and spirituality can mesh together very well. Peter, can I um, interject? Absolutely. Um, yeah, so Joshua, I really appreciated what you had to say. It just reminded me when you spoke about freedom, um, when I went to the Milton Center in the 1990s, so, among the people who uh, were kind of like the advisors were like Madeline Inga and writers like that. And there was like a debate, you know, at the time. Remember when there were all these evangelical Christian bookstores, right? And you had a section, this is the Christian literature, you know, and I always battled because what I wanted to write didn't fit into like the Frank Peretti, you know, it was, and I think with writing too, it's so specific, right? Like with music and art, you don't necessarily need to say, you know, this is who I am or who this is who the characters are. It's more emotional, but it, it's harder in writing because you have to kind of assign characters, you know, have to describe characters. And um, I think um, I found great freedom when I was among other writers who are, were, of the Christian faith, but it was like, they were defining, quote, Christian literature as, you know, Madeline Inga said she was a Christian and she was a writer, therefore she was a Christian writer. So it wasn't like this very narrow label of, you know, these are the things that only Christians should read or write. And um, I found great freedom once, you know, I was able to let go of the judgment of you know what you know, what I should write or what I shouldn't write. Thank you, Naomi and uh, panelists. Please feel free to talk amongst yourselves too and uh, en engage what uh, the richness of what what each other is saying. And um, yeah, it just this makes so much sense to that God is in the process and that. Um, Joshua, you've talked about this before too, that, you know, the more authentic you are to yourself, uh, it really frees that creative process. Um, makes me think about, um, I think it's an early, one of the early church father, fathers and mothers, um, Irenaeus said, you know, the glory of God is a, is a human being fully alive. And that 
you know, the more alive we are and live into who we are, um, God is glorifying. And um, I just hear that in, in what you each are saying. Um, I'm, I'm wondering just maybe a um, segue into another question is, is um, just knowing that and knowing who God is, um, how, and, and some of you already touched upon, a uh, few of you already touched upon kind of the church's role or lack thereof in it. Um, I wonder if you could each share about um, how the church or the Christian settings ha have supported or hindered your creativity or whether there has been a faith community that has particularly valued your work and uh, how, how has that been for you, that the community aspect of things? Yeah, I'm, I'm happy to share a little bit. Um, I, the, 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 this, this question is actually very pertinent to me right now. Um, I feel deeply supported by uh, the Episcopal uh, community here in Los Angeles, particularly uh, the church where I've been attending, Church of Our Savior, as well as the gathering. Um, I, I think as a freelance musician in Los Angeles, uh, particularly um, being a younger musician in town, uh, like church gigs are the worst. I mean, they're, they're terrible uh, because um, we, we truly are used as props. Um, and and in, in some instances, I, I've often felt that um, I have no contribute, contribution spiritually to what I have to create in the space. Rather, um, you know, oftentimes I've experienced being a musician for, uh, you know, as a cellist, I'm not usually um, attending regular services as, uh, you know, as like as an organist would and would be uh, saved for special events such as Easter and like larger uh, masses. And in those events, um, you, it, it was very much uh, a professional consulting service of me as a musician coming in to offer music to provide to a community I don't belong in and then to leave. Um, my experience at Church of Our Savior has been so fantastically different because I, I received an invitation to join the community um, that um, I no longer was making music for a community that I didn't belong in, but rather um, making music for a community I did belong in. Um, you know, one of the biggest uh, differences is, uh, you know, I, I came in to sub for a couple um, services and immediately after two weeks of, of, uh, of playing there, um, the, the church sent me a W4 asking me to join the staff. And I, and you know, that kind of offering has never been given to me from a church. It's always been a contractual obligation. And to immediately receive this kind of um, support and name that my gift matters uh, has empowered me so much to explore who I am in the art as an artist in the space. Um, you know, the, the Church of Our Savior has been so supportive of, of projects I've had um, brewing in terms of, you know, beyond the liturgy, beyond uh, Sunday services. Um, and yeah, but, I, but uh, you know, I, I say all of this because of my experience pr previously. I, I think that, um, uh, as I mentioned before, I, I, um, I often felt like a prop in many, in many spaces. And um, I, I think that uh, when in a spiritual space, if we don't name that we have gifts to offer, um, not just as musicians, but as parishioners, that we have a stakehold into this spiritual uh, communion that we're building together, um, it can be quite toxic. You know, uh, I, I've, I've, I've had many experiences where um, in my attempt to find belongingness, I, I feel maybe abused by the system or abused by the community in, in the sense that um, I, although I might have a spiritual stakehold into the service or into the liturgy or into um, trying to build something spiritually connected for me, uh, I find that like a lot of times as a musician, I, 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 I give my authentic gift and don't receive anything back. Um, so I, I really have so much gratitude for my recent experiences, um, both here at the gathering and, um, you know, just at, at, a, at Church of Our Savior. It's, it's something I've never experienced before and it gives me a lot of um, excitement and inspiration to continue making music. Thank you, Destin. Yeah, it's good to not be used and really be valued as a whole person and 
all that you can be and do uh, as well. Thank you for that insight. Um, Joshua and Naomi, any thoughts for you, from you too you want to contribute? Uh, I just wanted to briefly mention one, I, I won't even identify the church because I don't want to get anyone in trouble. And this is actually a good thing. Um, just being a struggling writer, you know, and there's, when I was, you know, a lot younger, I think in some group, I mentioned that just financially, it was a struggle. And um, someone in that church community who had sway, um, you know, they sent me the, through the church, they gave me money, you know, um, I know it's, it sounds like a really weird thing to be doing. But um, I think it was really encouraging to me that my faith community, you know, uh, w was, was essentially saying what you're doing is important, and you need this extra, you know, help. Um, so uh, yeah, I, I just, yeah, that was meaningful to me. That's great. Um, when I think about this question, I remember the fact that about three years ago, two, two and a half, three years ago, um, my, my sponsoring church, that, uh, the priest asked me if I would be interested in starting an artist group for the church because there, was a, there were a good amount of people who were in the arts or actors or musicians. So I said, of course I would. And it's been a great community so far. Since I've had, I've had to leave, three people have taken it over and they've been doing a great, great job. And it's promoted, it's really given space for artists to exist in a church. And I think that a lot of churches um, I have experienced are very, very open to having the same thing in their church. So that's a really good sign um, for the Episcopal Church. Because I really believe that um, the Episcopal Church is not afraid of, um, you know, can, being contaminated, you know, be contaminated by, you know, like worldly things, quote unquote, you know, and it's very open to experiencing different forms of interreligious studies and music and art and discussions about different viewpoints of art. And that's what the artist group does. We not only support each other to let each other know that we're there, but also the fact that we can talk about things that I think a lot of artists understand. You know, um, faith is a real issue. Uh, my friend Lucinda, who's on, mentioned this, that faith is a really interesting concept that artists probably have a different comprehension for. You know, it's abstract. It takes trust. It takes you know, going outside of the box. It's non-analytical. So I think art is, has a big, big role in our church, in the Episcopal Church. Um, I remember last semester I took a, litur uh, a lit liturgy class and we had to write a final paper and create a whole big program um, for, a, for a saint's day and for a, you know, a day of our choice. We had to create our own you know, formation program, Sunday school program, and then the whole church pro program, tape it, everything. <clears throat> and I did it on, um, I did it on um, Pentecost because Pentecost was the same month as Gay Pride. And so I did designed a whole imaginary church down to the point, part of all the Eucharistic uh, sacramental instruments were all made, handmade by people in the community as an offering to God. And I remember that one of the things that the bishop does would be, would come to like bless people. And I I found out in the, in the internet that, that there is such a thing as glitter, glitter um, blessing, where they literally glitter bomb people. And of course, outside of the church, and it was something that LGBTQ people might have found very interesting. And, and they were honored that they were accepted in the church. So all of these things prove the fact that, that the church can be very, very creative. 
And I remember my professor just writing the nicest note at the end of the semester and said, if you had this in your church, I'd come to your church. So that's something that was very touching that the, the professors, the working priests, all were very, very in, uh, accommodating and, and, and inclusive of everyone. So that was good. I just wanted to add one thing too, that that one um, writing workshop that I had at Evergreen, this is before they split. Um, there were quite a few immigrants that were part of the group. So, and the stories that kind of touched me were not the ones that were, you know, perfectly. I think sometimes people have with writing that it has to be pristine writing or, you know, what I'm looking for is kind of like the emotional stories. And um, it, it, I was able to get to know these people in a new way by hearing, you know, by them writing their stories. So I think there's a place like the church, you know, in encouraging people to do this. Um, they could, th their own, you know, uh, congregation could be deepened from hearing the, those type of stories. Thank you, Naomi. Yeah. And it really highlights the importance of process that it's not always so well formed. And I, I think artists and writers and musicians know this so well, because it's, there's this whole process of, you just don't pull it out of a hat, right? Like, and you wrestle with it, you struggle with it. And, um, and then you get glitter bumped at the end. So <laughs> Joshua, when you're, when you, when you do put on that um, service, make sure you invite all of us to go. Yeah. Lord willing. <laughs> yeah. Um, let's have one more question and then we'll, we'll give space for um, the audience or the attendees to uh, post more questions for, for all of us. Um, but uh, it's just, uh, I think it's about the process. Um, I'm wondering how that process has been for you, um, um, whether it's struggling or flow or the Holy Spirit, you know, I think artists often have a nearness to that um, sort of like the mystical ecstatic experience of creation. And I'm wondering um, how that how that has been for you. You know, where, where do you feel close to God uh, in your creative process, um, in the struggles and the flow? Uh, tell us about that. Or do you just sit down and everything just? No, I'm actually, um, I'm reading a part of a book right now for a class. And it's, um, it's a great quote that I wanted to share with you. And it's by um, an artist by the name of Makato Fujimura. And he says in the book called Art and Faith, in the first chapter called The Sacred Art of Creating, he states, art making to me is a discipline of awareness, prayer, and praise. And through this act, I begin to feel deeply the compassion of God for my own ex existence and by extension for the existence of others. My works, therefore, have a life of their own. I am listening to the voice of the creator through my creation, I am drawn into prayer as I work. I think to answer that question is, is, is first we have to understand that creating anything that's, creating anything is God's presence is, is there, whether it is uh, a commercial piece or not, whether it's doing a TV commercial or whether it's designing shoes. You know, I get great, I, great, I get great feeling when something is successful. So when my shoes sell really, really well at stores, and when I get emotional reactions by women about why they want to wear something, I see God in that. I see the presence of the mystic, the creativity. You know, it is a process, even though it's a commercial process where buyers come in and and, and um, marketing people come in and all that stuff. As a designer, yes, 
all those stages, I have to defend my work or work with them. But still something like, like this quote is, is, is that in all of these things, God's presence is there. And especially as a Christian, I feel like even though those, that journey was very, very tough, um, God gave me the strength to be with those people. And that is part of the journey of, of, of uh, my Christian experience. So, um, so I think that anything that we do, big and small in the church, whether it is quilts or whether it is flower arrangement or whether whatever you think, even though you, if you don't think you have any talent, it is still God's presence in those beautiful things that create the whole service, the whole ambiance, and the whole presence. You know, how someone enters a church, how they feel about the grounds, how's the liturgy presented, how are the music, all that stuff is all part of creativity. And those who are very creative, I hope will just continue to, to add to it, to build it, to make it stronger. Since I'm primarily a genre writer, so plot is important to what I write. Um, I really see that, you know, we do have to be, we have to breathe the life um, into our works. Because if I force my, if I know this character needs to be here, needs to be here and here, I could try to push the character to do that. And they just flatten, you know, they become like paper dolls. So there is that sense of, I don't know if it's mystic or what, but like you blow, you know, you're really blowing in the life into your work. And I know that I'm in a good space when I'm following my characters. So it's not like, you know, they're just, it's kind of like they have free will. They're, you, know, you created it, but they're kind of just going along and you're going, wait a minute, don't go there. But they do. And, it, and sometimes it makes the story much better. Um, Naomi said something that uh, at the very beginning um, today that really struck me about how we as artists don't live live this like fantasy life or like the romantic thing of being in solidarity. Um, I, I, or I'm not solidarity, solitude. Sorry. Um, and and but rather we 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 find our most creative space when we're in community. At least I do. And um, uh, I, I want to push that even further and say, I think where I most viscerally feel God's work in my artistry is when I'm in community and I'm in a community of dissent. I'm in a, in a, and I'm in a place of uncomfortability. Um, uh, I, I, um, I, I listened to a very moving sermon earlier this summer about um, Jesus walking on water and, um, and, uh, and um, the rector had a very interesting perspective about sharing how Water has this uh, trait of being very polar. It's a very it has it is a, a, a substance that's very that's very polarized, and um, that uh, Jesus walking on water is a metaphor of him walking above the polarity, and that we as humans may not need to resolve polarity but sit in it, sit sit in the polarity and find find where we belong within the polarity, and um, I. I, I've, I felt a calling from God that my divine, divine responsibility as a as a as an artist is to stand in the gap, and 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 to name that where we might not find the place where we can be um, unified. Um, perhaps music and the arts can sit in that gap. Um, I, I I have I have yet to really fully unpack an experience I had this summer, but um, I had the wonderful opportunity to share um, very intimate music uh, with my church community um, uh, through a, a you know, chamber music recital where I invited some of my closest friends. And uh, we, played, uh, we played the same program at my church in a very nice, you know, very comfortable uh, neighborhood in San Gabriel. And, and that, that same week, we played the same programs in several facilities in Skid Row. Um, we played the same program at the Downtown Women's Center. We played the same program at the Midnight Mission. And um, I remember the one end of the week, I, I, I felt 
I, 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 there was this incredible weight on my shoulders right before I was about to play the program at church. And um, I just like started breaking down and I had, I had like an, a, 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 you know, a little bit of a, a moment right before I started playing the concert. But in that moment, I realized what, what I was wrestling was with the fact that, um, you know, um, excuse my language, but it's kind of fucked up that I just played the same Brahms quartet um, or I'm about to play the same Brahms quartet here at, you know, in a, in a very well-off community, in a very well-endowed ch church here at, in, San, in San Gabriel. And I just played the same program for folks at, you know, at, at the Midnight Mission. And what I, what I really felt was um, how, how is, uh, because I played the same music in the space, I, I felt this weird reaction of, oh, um, you know, this church is, uh, it's a temple, it's a spiritual temple. And so is the Midnight Mission. The Midnight Mission is a temple. Um, the uh, uh, you know, and uh, and at the same time, how how is uh, Skid Row a place where people go to die, and how is also the church a place where people go to die? Where where's the Skid Row here in San Gabriel? Where's the Skid Row within us? And uh, in in that desolate space, I also asked the question: How how is a place like Skid Row the place where people find? Um, their their relationship with God and, and and their and their and their redemption and how do we also find that here at, at this church and and you know I don't have an answer um, and I think that um, but that's where I think we can we can lean on each other and lean on our gifts that God our artistic gifts that God has given us to maybe have a maybe have a sense of understanding of what it means to stand in the camp and what it means to be above the polarity um, we, maybe, maybe the answer isn't let's find where we're not polar anymore, but how can we continue to uplift each other in this polarity? Um, so uh, yeah, that's, that's I, I deeply find God's presence in, when I ask these questions. Oh, um, thank you, Dustin. Just highlighting the importance in, of standing in the gap, you know, especially through art and encouraging us to do so. Um, there's a prophetic element in, in art that um, can be so powerful. And uh, I hope we have, if we have some, some more time today, we can explore that in terms of what that, look, what that could look like or what that has looked like um, in, through your, each of your works. Um, I, I know we want to have some time for a uh, question and answer uh, or Q&A with uh, our attendees. And so uh, let's switch gears to that momentarily and uh, see what questions we have out there. Um, Sharon, have you um, some questions you have for us that you've collected um, through um, in the chat? Yes, the first question comes from Eric Law. And he says, this was inspired by Naomi, but it's for all of you. Um, since Asian American Pacific history slash context is not as well known and or acknowledged, how much context should artists offer without buying into the system that caused AAPI artists to be in the defensive in sharing our creations? Yeah, I, I saw that um, comment, and I'm glad because it's a weighty one, so you got to kind of think about it. But um, I, what came to mind is um, there's a Pulitzer Prize winner, Viet Thanh Nguyen, um, who wrote The Sympathizer, and he teaches at USC, and he feels really strongly like Asian American Pacific Islanders should not have to explain. Like there's this whole um, evolution like uh, in terms of like uh, Japanese words or Vietnamese words or whatever that are in our work, we shouldn't italicize it. It shouldn't, we shouldn't have like one comment. I wrote a uh, very pungent work in, um, in the beginning of my career. Um, my first novel was su called Summer of the Big Bachi. And bachi means what goes around, comes around. You're, uh, you must be J.A. Sharon, because you laugh. <laughs> but um, yeah, so, and some people commented, why did you put, why didn't you put a glossary? So we could, because I, I tried to define this in the context of, you know, 
making it as natural as possible. So it, it is um, a thing that that as a writer, and I I I told I'm somewhat envious of our musicians and visual artists because you you guys have this language that I mean you know with writing you have to put a specific language and I think your work transcends language which is so powerful and wonderful. But um, anyway, uh, uh, so I I. I wrestle with that, with the my latest book, Clark and Division, it's told from a Nisei, a, Japanese, a second generation Japanese American uh, point of view. And I do kind of contextualize some of the things like how, why wasn't, because a lot of people ask like, why, why weren't the Japanese Americans, why didn't they fight the incarceration? Why didn't, you know, and I really wanted to get into this head of this character. So in some ways I was showing, I mean, telling, you know, more than my other work, but uh, you know, the way, the way I kind of reconciled in my mind is there's a lot of um, fourth, third generation, fourth generation Japanese Americans who were never told, you know, by their elders of what happened. So there's gaps even within a certain ethnic group, you know, generationally. And so I just felt, in that context, I felt a freedom to kind of contextualize that a little bit more. So, yeah, that's my answer. Thank you, Naomi. I, 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 I do want to jump really quickly into this. Naomi, I, I really appreciate the nuances that you're naming about the different experiences that multiple generations of Asian Americans have. And um, I think uh, an immediate pressure as a second generation Asian American um, is to immediately claim some kind of authentic relationship to Korean traditional culture that I have, um, even though I don't. Um, and and it, it's, it's, you know, um, like uh, immediately as soon as there's this conversation around like Asian Americanness and like, you know, how, how like, you know, whitewashing and assimilation that it's like, oh, you as an Asian, you must be the one to want to be chasing back into your heritage. And I, 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 I'll be talking very specifically from my experience because I think it is very nuanced, but um, I, I, I find that to be almost uh, um, like, it, it's, it's a turnoff for me. Uh, you know, like this one time I, I was with working with a colleague um, from the Skid Row community. His name is Ray and he is a uh, amazing community leader and um, has found his recovery in um, exploring his roots as a West African drummer and exploring the traditions of West African drumming. And uh, one time he invited me to play with him and uh, I, I sat with him um, and he was sharing some uh, rhythms that he's been working on from his, uh, from what he's learned from his uh, mentors from Senegal. And he asked me, what are you working on? And I had no idea what to say because I have not explored that myself, um, and I immediately my 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 visceral reaction is like, oh, uh, here's a pentatonic scale because I'm Asian. Oh, like I I guess I know one Korean song. Like I can try to play that. And he kept asking me, he's like, no, 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 what are you working on? And I, it, it like in like kind of defeat, I started playing Bach, and he was like, oh, that's what you're working on. That's beautiful. What does that represent? And like, and he and then we started making music together with what was authentic to me and. It's to name that I am authentically Asian American. I am authentically a classically trained cellist in a Western tradition, and um, I I should not have to defend my Asian Amer or Asianness or my Asian Americanness. My the way I'm starting to reconcile and re reclaim some of my heritage is I've been since the pandemic I've been taking basic Korean classes on Zoom, and like you know I've I've like. I, you know, I, I have to be honest in name, my parents didn't use Korean around me because they wanted me to be American and I, I don't speak in Korean. So like now, you know, being, you know, getting to learn my language is what my artistic practice is. Um, and uh, as artists, we should be able to explore what reclaiming our heritage is for ourselves individualistically and, um, and in a nuanced way, not in a way that feels like uh, you know, for a lack of a better word, a co-opt, a, a co opty way of, uh, you know, being like, oh, Asians are being uh, cultural, so we can let Asians, be, you know, and so, so it's, it's a very nuanced question, and I really appreciate your nuanced response, Naomi. The only experience that I have is um, 
I remember one of the first photo shoots I ever had was for, and a TV commercial was for, um, for a Thanksgiving scene. And it was like American classic, you know, with the fire, with the chimney in the background and, and everyone's wearing the right kind of sweaters and all that kind of stuff. And I remember getting this project and I thought to myself, it is so ironic to be asking an Asian to be doing this when I, when my family never grew up um, having Thanksgivings, you know, um, but I had to play the role and it was really actually very fun to put yourself in the mindset of someone who grew up, grew up with that. And um, and I and I look back now at 2021, and I think that we are heading towards something that's more diverse, culturally more diverse, in, at least in the field of advertising, that we are more included, we are not so stereotyped, um, but there's still a lot more room to be had for that. And it starts really for, it starts with Asians having the training and then having the positions that can make a difference in the in the world of commercial art you know I'm really really glad to see somewhere like art center is has such a high percentage of Asians as students and they're going to come out and they're going to have their viewpoints and they're going to be defending certain things that need to be changed so we need to get to the point where we are now penetrating into higher positions, decision-making positions in the art world, writers, uh, script, script writers, producers, you know, Netflix people, Amazon people that will make, pro produce new kinds of media. And, and we need it and people are, are ready to accept it. Thank you. Thank you, Joshua and Naomi and Dustin for um, engaging this really thoughtful question, you know, about context and um, just what is our role in being declarative and all that we do, and yet do we have to still explain everything when there's Wikipedia and people, people can just look things up too. Um, Let's see. I'm I'm mindful of our uh, the time that we have. I was wondering if um, Sharon, are there other questions that we want to address, or I wanted to see if um, the panelists could share with us some um, closing thoughts too. Well, we just got one more question. So, do, what do you think? Do we have time, or because I think closing thoughts are important. Um, I, I hate to be the one that nixes the question, especially coming from uh, Joshua, uh, coming from Joshua's husband, Edward. Um, maybe, I, I think it's a great question. How do you as artists leverage spirituality and faith when you need motivation and encouragement if others may not understand your creativity? Um, I, I'm also mindful of time and... Um, Maybe if, if in, as a closing thought, if, if any of you uh, would like to answer that or uh, offer some encouragement or um, in lieu of that, offer some encouragement or closing thoughts um, for those in attendance, uh, please feel free to do so. Well, I, I do have one thought and it's, and it's, relates to the church actually, because at least um, maybe just for me at, in my work, I've had a whole career of just having to motivate and work with people to get ideas through. And I think it's very similar actually to the work of the church. In the vestry, in the church, in the changing of the church, we need to motivate with a lot of patience and with a lot of clarity, and with a lot of forgiveness, but also with a lot of, um, like, um, trust that our ideas are good. 
And it may not, it may take off very quickly or it may not, but it's really about earning, earning trust in the people that you work with in the church to build it. Whether it's a new ministry towards uh, the community, whether it's even redecorating, you know, the Eucharistic table or whatever, we need to, we need to, um, we need to be able as a whole community work together in respect for new ideas to happen. And I think that that takes part in both the artists and the non-artists, hoping that we focus on the fact that we're trying to do the best for everyone. It's the same thing as coming up with the 20 shoes that are gonna be in the collection. You know, everyone's guessing. The style is gonna sell, the style is not, but it takes everyone to trust and to believe in each other and to support each other, not to blame each other. And I think that that's the same thing that goes on in our church, in our community, in our micro communities, so. Well, thank you, Joshua. Um. Uh, I guess as a closing, and, and, and I said this recently, I belong to a genre group called Sisters in Crime, <laughs> and they were asking for writing tips. And one thing I said was, uh, because voice is like a really important part of writing, especially fiction, and as you develop, as we as writers develop our craft and figure out what our voice is, and this is in line to our discussions of being our, our, our authentic self, that um, there may be a tendency to reject our voice, kind of like some parents do with their children. It's like they want to say, you be this, you be that. And we may have our um, gold standard of what our like written voice should be. But um, I think what's been helpful for me is to accept the voice that has breathed, has been breathed into me. And, and something like writing, it's not going to resonate with all people, you know, so if you're searching for a lot of fame, or you're searching for a lot of acceptance, I think that's the wrong way to go about it. And then once you, and your voice will resonate with the people that it, it's supposed to resonate with. So just to have peace about that. And um, yeah, and uh, I, I think that's why it's helpful to be with other writers or other artists, you know, that, and, and uh, Joshua had mentioned that uh, before in response to what Edward has says, has a um, question to be in community and to kind of encourage yourself, like nobody understands us even our spouse maybe, <laughs> but when we come together, we understand what we're trying to do. And, you know, although we may be in different stages. I absolutely agree with both Naomi and Joshua. Um, as a closing statement, I, I wanna say as an artist, we're only one part of the, um, we're, we're only one part of a community that's trying to build something together. Um, we, we may be the ones that uh express the or like creative process and maybe cr like you know put to get physically put together the product or you know the, the offering but um that's not done by just us um we are only one stakeholder and one steward of that process um and quite frankly uh perhaps the 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 um when we find this community when we find this trust with the people that we're creating something together um uh it doesn't matter if others don't understand the creativity as long as we understand what we're trying to build together. Um, you know, I, in, in the same way that my work will not happen without the super supporters who's to, who are excited about my work or, you know, the, the funders that support like whatever mission I might be working towards and, 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 and to move beyond uh, an idea of transactional relationship as artist and, and, and part, uh, you know, participants or audience or whatever, but rather a stewardship that we're building something together. Um, you know, Naomi is writing a book, not because she's putting out a product into the world and then like piecing out, you know, uh, Naomi is writing a book to engage an audience in the community that's already committed to her work 
into the stories that she's telling. And um, her work would not exist without the folks who are interested in the work. Same way with Joshua, you're, you're, you're creating um, beautiful artwork, not to just float in, in, in outer space, but, but to engage, to, to be received to a community that wants it. And you know, in the same way, I, I believe that when I create music, I'm not, it's not a one-way street. I am not just a prop on stage to share music, to make people feel good for a second and leave, but rather to um, invest into a community and invest into um, a, like, you know, the, this moment of connectivity that we can continue growing on. So um, yeah, I, I think that this work, um, you know, as, as I'll, I, I hope I'm speaking for the panel, but all, all three of us, I believe, really truly value everyone else on this screen um i truly value the community at the gathering and um none of our work and creative process could be possible without those who are making it with us well thank you thank you dustin for the sharing those thoughts just um how important it is to really have not create in the vacuum and and to create in context create with the community um create with the inspiration that comes from god so um thank you thank you for your stories thank you for your craft and um your what you bring to this world um this conversation is way too short we we want to find another way to continue this so um I, I hope there's i think there's an, an there's agreement in that among those in attendance that this this has been very enjoyable very thoughtful and and very very rich so thank you um thank you all thank you panelists for joining us today and really illuminating um our thoughts um and adding to our spiritual journey through through all that you've shared we're so 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 grateful for um, what you brought to us today thank you very much um i um, want to turn this time over to mel um who has um some uh closing thoughts and announcements i think for us but um so mel thanks peter um before i turn it over to jenny for the uh, final uh, prayers I'd like to uh, share a, a few words from the gathering. Um, first of all, uh, we do want to thank all of you attendees for joining us. On behalf of the gathering, we know how much these mean to you, and we hope that you'll inform us of, of the things that matter to you. And if you have some ideas, please do share them with us. And thank you, especially to Naomi and Dustin and Joshua. We are so very grateful for all that you've shared and so much deep insight about yourself and your art and your faith. If I had a glitter bomb right now, I'd throw it all at you and, and um, because this felt like church to me and, and I'm very grateful for that. For myself, I'd like to thank all of the gathering who helped put this together. Sharon, uh, Crandall, and Kim, Joy Swaving, uh, uh, Dustin uh, Nguyen, uh, Jenny and uh, Bishop Diane uh, for starting us off, and of course, Peter for moderating us all this time. Uh, just a quick note about myself, um, Mel Soriano, he, him. I'm a postulant in the diocese uh, along with Joshua and have been part of the gathering planning team since I spoke on a panel um, and moderated uh, on, on, on another panel about three and a half years ago. Uh, I will be doing my field education focused on the gathering, so I'll be quite interested in hearing all the things you appreciate about the gathering and, and how we can share these blessings with others. Um, I'm now going to uh, share uh, some slides to, show, to give you some heads up uh, on what's coming up with the gathering. Uh, we have, oops, let me... Uh, get these out of the way. We have the gathering spot this coming Wednesday. Uh, the gathering spot is every first Wednesday of the month at five o'clock. And it's a chance for us to be in fellowship with each other and to share some, some thoughts and, uh, and prayers. And, and of course, because we do it regularly, 
to do so in the context of what's happening in our world and in our lives today. Um, on October 23rd, Sunday uh, at four o'clock, uh, the same time as we met today, we will be remembering the Los Angeles Chinese Massacre of 1871. It's the 150th anniversary this year. And the day before that actual horrible event, we will be remembering it and, and looking at the history and some of the impact that has had on the lives of Asians uh, and Asian Americans here, and perhaps how we can learn from that as it guides our lives and our faith today. And lastly, uh, we would like to um, invite you to consider supporting the gathering uh, by uh, clicking on this link and sharing uh, some of the resources and, and, and gifts that you have encountered and are more than willing to uh, share with others here in the diocese and across the country. Uh, if you are um, needing this link, uh, it'll be, it is on our website, uh, which is at the bottom of the screen. It is on our website at, towards the bottom of the first page. So please uh, consider doing that. And uh, with that, I'd like to turn this over to Jenny. Let us pray. Creator God, thank you for making us in your image and blessing us with the ability to create and gifting us with beauty. We give thanks for our panelists today, Naomi, Dustin, Joshua, for their beautiful souls and their expressions of your love and wonder. May you open our eyes to all your beauty that surrounds us each and every day. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen. Thank you all for joining us today and we hope to see you at our next gathering.